Good afternoon. Welcome to Grandstand from inside the Centre Court building. Today it's ladies' finals day and this is the way the players will come down from the dressing room down this impressive staircase. It also doubles for guests in the Royal Box. While they head up there to their seats, the players will come down here and onto court. And what an impressive entrance. On one side, the famous Roll of Honour, and on the other side, the wonderful trophies. The ladies' trophy is that beautiful plate. For me, the most beautiful trophy in tennis. Today is Venus Williams, the defending champion, takes on Justin Ennan, the new star of women's tennis. One of those players will pick up that wonderful trophy later this afternoon. But the ladies' final is at 2 o'clock. Before that, in well, it's just 45 minutes, Tim Hemman, the British number one, will be back on court for his unfinished semi-final. I wonder if he'll just have a little glance left at this uh, men's singles trophy. Oh, sorry, should I say gentlemen's singles trophy? Because today, Tim is trying to make history by becoming the first Briton through to the final for 63 years. And if you want to find the last British winner, you have to go even further back. And it's a long Long way up this roll of honour here, right the way, all these great champions to Fred Perry in 1936. So that is the task facing Tim Henman, but what makes this the most unusual, the most famous and the most nerve-wracking walk in tennis is that you have to go under these famous words of Rudyard Kipling. And I wonder if it will be triumph or disaster for Tim this afternoon. <laughs> Continuing the walk through the second set of double doors, joining me, former champion Pat Cash. But Pat, you've got the brolly up. This is this no. is where we left off last night. I oh, know. Well, not much you can do about that, really, is there? Yeah. Unless you've got know somebody I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the trouble is that it only just started raining about ten minutes ago, but it obviously means that it's going to be tight for that one o'clock start. But we've just come down that amazing walk. I mean, you've done that on finals day. Just how nerve-wracking is? Well, I came up because the women come oh, down. Yeah. We're yes. in the men's locker yes. room, so we on come up. On the lower up, floor. It, it, look, it is, I, I've got to be honest, it, it really is a terrifying experience. I mean, as ma many times I had been through, you know, these doors, uh, when it comes to finals day, it's a different story. And, mm. and of course, they've got this little waiting room here, which they used to put the players in, which... Yes, it's just in I that window there. I don't think yes. they do that anymore. But I was terrified. I heard the stories about how they used to put the, the two finalists in there, and they used to shut the door and wait until they were ready. And I couldn't imagine having this guy opposite you, you wanted to, you know, beat the hell out of. Uh, you know, right opposite you, but they didn't do that. I sort of put my bags in there and, and just sort of walked around a little bit. So I didn't have to actually sit in there with Yvonne Lendl, but, uh, but then actually coming out here... <laughs> he wouldn't here, have said a lot anyway. No, actually he's, he, he was doing a lot of the chatting. I was sort of keep, trying to keep calm, but when you actually come through these doors and people see you... Well, let's do, let's do the walk, because just describe it as we go. Well, it's about here that these people here can see you, and they... And they um, then the roar starts coming and that's when all of a sudden it all hits you and the difference between the semi-final and a final atmosphere was just absolutely phenomenal I just could not believe it all of a sudden it was like an electricity bolt had hit you and it was like wow and by the time you got here the whole crowd was just completely absolutely roaring and uh, you got a chance to walk on the, the hallowed turf again 
talking of I mean, walking on the hallowed turf, I mean, you you won it, but have have you have you actually put a toe on there since? Well, I have since, but the year that I the year that I, after I won it, I came here when it was the day before the tournament, just to have a little look at the at the court and the stadium, and and maybe just to get a feel on the grass and just to sort of get my you collect my thoughts and I came down here about where we were and a security guard came over to me and I said oh hi I'm Pat Cash I won the tournament he says yeah I know you Pat I said I uh, just wonder if I can just feel how wet the grass is you know because every year the grass is a little different and he radioed up and he said oh Pat, Pat Cash he wants to step on the grass and the, the word came back nope no. cannot step on the grass could not step on the grass God oh, don't do that <laughs> So, there you go. I've got, it, got my own back. I'll tell you what, Pat, it looks even impressive under the canvas, doesn't it? It looks fantastic uh, shape, the court oh, this look, year. It's, 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 a great, it's a great court. I mean, they had some ups and downs with the grass over the years, and they've changed the groundsman. And oh, hold on I a minute. Think... Oh, oh. oh, is this Eddie? Yeah, you're back to film. Oh, no, Eddie, oh. We're, we're live on air, Eddie. Don't worry. I thought we thought, Eddie, we thought you Did were you coming over to, to tell, tell me off again. Off. <laughs> Eddie? Uh oh <laughs> no, I mean, he's gone. I think Eddie's gone now. He's gone a bit camera shy. At least you didn't get in trouble, you see. You're all right. Is, it, is there any moisture got on the court at None all today? Whatsoever. None whatsoever. So that is great news today. No moisture on centre court. So once this cover comes off, then play will get underway. Very well, sorry, good. I'm oh, getting you wet, aren't that's I? Okay. I wasn't oh. going to say anything, but never mind. You know, that's... <laughs> sorry about that. But let's talk about uh, today. Tim Henman's coming on court. Mm. And, and it's, I mean, there's a lot of criticism. You know, maybe they could have finished the match last night, possibly. But it's, a, it's an agonising wait for for both players. Well, you know, I think I think it's going to help, help Goran. I mean, uh, I think Tim was going to win last night if the rain hadn't stopped. It's, it's going to help Goran. Whether he can actually pull it together or not, um, we don't know. We waited the whole, we waited for 10 days or two weeks for Goran to snap and, and he finally did in the third set and Tim just, um, Tim plays some great tennis and cruised through. Um, it's going to help him having that little break. But, you know, um, the other, the other, the good thing about this is that if Tim goes through and he hasn't got a day sitting around thinking about winning his Wimble yeah. Wimbledon title. It's a and long wait, isn't it? That day, day off, that yeah. day off was, uh, which is today, mm. um, would, would have been today. It was a really tough day for me because mm. I, I just went through everything in my mind, and I just sort of, I put a uh, Charles Bronson movie on and just watched him shoot and bang up a few people <laughs> and try to get my mind off it. But every time, <laughs> non-stop, it's the thought keeps coming in your head: this is it, this is it, this is it, this is your chance, mm. and don't blow it. And, because you, you just don't know if you're going to get another chance. Uh, I think as a youngster you think, oh, you're going to be able to, be able to play for 100 years. But, mm. you know, the reality is for me is I never got another chance uh, for various reasons. And these guys mightn't either. You know, Rafter said he might retire. Uh, so this is his last chance, perhaps. You know, Henman, how many chances is he going to get? Well, they certainly say it's his best chance, isn't it, so far? Yeah, I mean, you know, he, he may have some more years. But Goran certainly looks like, you know, who knows where he's going to be next year. Uh, so. You know, it keeps coming through your head that this is the op this is the one that you want to win, and so it's a big, big day the day before of little nerves and. Ugh. You just want to try and switch your mind off somehow, but you can't. Yeah, as you say, it's probably, it probably would be nice for him to be out here. I just hope that the stands actually fill up because they brought it forward on the ticket. It will actually say 2 o'clock in the afternoon uh, for the start of play. But, of course, Tim Hemman, hopefully, will be on court at uh, 1 o'clock or certainly around that time. And uh, let's uh, hope that he has a rousing welcome when he comes off court uh, for that match. Pat, thank you very much. But, of course, following on from uh, Tim and Goran, we've got the ladies' final today. And that uh, is a real match of contrast between the defenders champion and a future champion but will it be this year for the talented 19 year old from Belgium Justine Ennan who's one of the most stylish players on tour <laughs> And I know you're speaking of me. Too good. Just too good. Fascinating thing. Get beside me. I want you to love me. There's that back end. I'm surprised you never been told before. That you're lovely and you're perfect. And that somebody wants you.
And in the final, Enan takes on the reigning champion, Venus Williams, who combines power, fitness and belief. Will it be back-to-back -back wins for the 21-year-old? So this is the order of play for today on Centre Court. Uh, and of course, we are saying one o'clock start, but you've seen the rain coming down the covers on Centre Court. But uh, hopefully, it'll soon be dry and the players will be on. Tim Henman against Goran Ivanisevic to finish. Of course, Henman leads by two sets to one and 2-1 in the fourth set. So it could be all over in four games. We'll wait and see. And then the ladies' singles final, Justin Enan of Belgium, the number eight seed. And uh, did you know that never has a number eight seed ever won the championships here? Will it be a first this time for Justin Enan? She takes on the defending champion, Venus Williams. So now, uh, before the tennis, let's uh, catch up with the news from elsewhere. Starting with Rugby Union, Australia have squared the three-test series against the British and Irish Lions, winning the second test in Melbourne by 35 points to 14. The Lions led 11-6 at half-time, thanks to a kneel-back try and two penalties from Johnny Wilkinson. But two Joe Roth tries for Australia in the opening 10 minutes of the second half turned the game on its head, and a further try from Matt Burke sealed a convincing win. To add to the Lions' woes, Johnny Wilkinson was stretched off with a leg injury three minutes from time. The deciding third and final test is next Saturday in Sydney. And in the first Ashes test, Darren Goff has captured the wicket of Steve Waugh this morning, but Australia are building a large first innings advantage against England at Edgbaston. Waugh was out LBW, having added just four to his uh, overnight century, but Damian Martin and Adam Gilchrist are compiling another useful partnership for the tourists. That's the score at the moment, but rain has stopped play at Edgbaston as well. But Pat, we're not bad news from down under then, for the Lions. Well... You well, beat us. Yeah, I know. We, we, well, we expected the, that to, us to come back pretty heavily, I think. <laughs> it's unbelievable how many. We've got the, the Ashes, the Test, and we might have Rafter versus uh, Henman. I mean, this is this We is may not be speak crazy. to you by the end of the weekend. I know. <laughs> I know I'm, well, I'm leaving anyway. I think it's, maybe it's a good move. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Pat, thanks very much. Well, as I said, hopefully tennis uh, will be coming up very soon here this afternoon. But we are, are going to start with athletics. And it was a very busy night uh, yesterday in Paris. Let's join Roger Black for Athletics Focus. It's summertime and we're here in Paris, but for the world's best athletes, it's just another city with another track, as the Grand Prix circuit moves here to France for the second Golden League meeting of the season. And with the World Championships in Edmonton only a month away, the athletes have got more than Paris on their minds. Uh, I'm looking for a top form. I'm trying to find my comfortable race that I've been feeling running the past years, and I'm just not comfortable about my 100 meter race this year yet, so um, I'm just trying to get comfortable with my 100 meter race and get ready for Edmonton. The most important thing is the victory. Um, on, the, on paper it doesn't say, okay, you, you won by this much, so it says you, you won the race. And, and I want to win five races here in the Golden League, that's the important thing. My objective this year the, the, the world champion because uh, I want the gold medal. I always think about Canada, about the world championships, even though we have all those Grand Prix races and Golden League first before that. But it's very important to train in, in and racing this Grand Prix races has a preparation towards all championships in Canada. I went to the U.S. trials and ran really well there, so I feel like, for the most part, I'm I'm on on pace. Uh, usually, other years this time of year, I'm running a little bit better, but I feel like in four weeks I'll be right where I want to be, ready to to try to be world champion again. My mind now is to Edmonton, of course. 
I don't know why I win or not win in Edmonton, but I'm happy to be there. My first World Championship experience wasn't a very good one for me. So uh, I want to go out here and have uh, a good showing in Edmonton. Uh, it's important to me. Uh, I would like to go out and be world champion. I mean, Olympic goal is good, but um, more goal is better. That's what I'm here for, is to find my top form in the 100 meters and get myself prepared for Edmonton. As long as I'm going through everything, finding my top form, I'll be finding Edmonton. Well, the French champion drawn in lane one, Brian Lewis of the United States in two, Ebiquelo of Nigeria in three, then Williams of the United States in four, Maurice Green in five, Montgomery of the United States in six, Pat Jarrett of Jamaica in seven, Bruni Surin of Canada in eight, and Marcus Brunson of the United States in lane nine. Well, the Olympic champion, good season thus far, first in Rome, first in Lausanne, two very good victories. Fire. Last to rise and Green, last to rise and gets a brilliant start. He's going wonderfully well at the moment. Is Montgomery going with him on the outside? Brunson going well and so is uh, Williams and Obiquello. And look at this from Maurice Green. He takes it. He's won it again and Montgomery in second place. And it was a tight finish for third between Obiquello and Williams. And from the start, Green got a stormer. He really did. Uh, Montgomery went with him. And on the near side, Brunson went well but then faded. And uh, it was between Williams and Obiquello for third. But this is a dominant piece of running for Green. Sub-10, once again. Look at the power, such leg speed. A superb victory for the Olympic champion. Well, let's bring you up to date with the time. 9.96, a third sub-10 in a row. He's now talking trackside to Steve Cram. Maurice, sub-10, into a slight headwind. Coming together nicely now. Yeah, it's coming together. I've still, I, don't, I still don't feel as comfortable as I would like to for my race, but it's coming together. And I'm, I'm, my goal is to be prepared for... Edmonton and I think I will be. Just a word on Edmonton, I'm not going to ask you about the need tonight but there's, there's talk that, oh, I don't know whether it's come from you about your thinking about the 200 maybe not running it in Edmonton? Well it just all depends on if I feel 100% I will go through it, if I don't I, I'm, I won't be able to. When would you make that decision? When I get there. In the women's 3,000 metres, Olga Yegorova once again proved what a devastating finish she has. She kicked with 200 metres to go to outsprint her two Russian teammates and Gabby Jarbo in the fastest time in the world this year. And Great Britain's Kathy Butler set a personal best in 10th place. Colin Jackson, the 110 metres hurdles, not 100% fit, we're told, but we'll see. He's in the seventh lane. Clarico of France, Bounds of South Africa, Dorevel of Haiti, Alan Johnson of the United States, Garcia of Cuba, Arnold of the United States, Jackson of Great Britain, Tramel of the United States, Hernandez of Cuba. And what a race this should be. And Johnson's away brilliantly, so is Garcia. And on the near side, Hernandez of Cuba going well. And this is a very fine race. The Olympic champion versus the world champion. The former world champion is coming through. And Johnson takes it, Garcia's in second place and that was a superb run by Trammell in third place and Colin Jackson sneaked through into fourth but look at that time 13.16 and this is the best piece of technical hurdling I've seen since uh, Ronaldo Nehemiah in 1983 Alan Johnson in that uh, fourth lane the former world champion back to his very very best beats the Olympic champion Look at this, pure poetry in motion. Clips the hurdle, but that is a superb piece of sprinting off it. He runs so brilliantly between the hurdles. Close to 10 seconds flat over 100 metres. Clipping hurdles, he's very close. The margins are small, but he comes through with the fastest time in the world this year. Confirm that, 13.15. Garcia, 13.23 in second. Colin, what do you make of that? 13.42, fourth? Uh, obviously I'm disappointed in the position, but um, really I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed when I wake up tomorrow that uh, things are nice and calm. I've got a bad groin at this moment and I can't really generate any power through that part of my body. So uh, I really have to go out there and run and see how I felt and fingers crossed that I don't really have bad effects tomorrow morning. The women's 800 metres and once again it was the Olympic gold and silver medalists Maria Matola and Stephanie Graf who made this race into as much a battle of wills as endurance. Their Sydney positions were reversed, with Austrian Graf winning in two minutes dead by just over one-tenth of a second. 
Since achieving a silver medal in the Olympics and World Indoor Championships at 1500 metres, Violetta Sekeli of Romania has had things pretty well her own way, first in the European Cup and in Rome, and again here in Paris. A time, 4 minutes, 1.55. Kenya predictably filled the first three places in the 3,000 metre steeplechase with the fastest time seen in the world this year. It was a brilliant sprint finish by Wilson Voigt Kipkita, his winning time 8 minutes, 8 seconds, 0.13. The 400 metre hurdles and Angelo Taylor of the United States drawn in lane 5, Stefan Diagana of France drawn in lane 4. Good draw for the French former world champion. Matete, Al Somali of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Olympic silver medalist, Carter of the United States, Diagana and Taylor, then Tamisu of Japan, Thomas of the United States, and Weekly of Jamaica on the outside. Well, Tamisu always goes off quickly and this is another of those occasions he's already up on the shoulder of eric thomas who's a 48-5 man this season so tamisu running very quickly may well pay for that at the moment uh diagana and taylor these two contesting in the middle two lanes diagana's certainly got the better draw he's got the olympic champion in his sights he's already going past him now so diagana now begins to move into the lead not a lot in it though 200 meters to go and less and uh, Diagana certainly the leader and Taylor's got a lot of running to do on the outside and Tamasu has been run down Diagana leads right on the inside Carter of the United States going strongly at the moment Al Somali going well too the Olympic silver medalist and oh look at this Diagana's faltering and Taylor's coming through and it's going to be very very close and oh I think I think Taylor from Diagana with uh, Al Somali in third place 48.13 and the former world champion yes has been run down once again it was close wasn't it Oh, 48-1-3. The Olympic champion keeps his unbeaten record. Well, it was faster than that, 48.10 to Diagana's 48.13. What a race. Angelo, you managed to spoil the French party there, but it was very close on the line. Yeah, you know, uh, I knew it was going to be a hard race running right here in uh, Paris, in uh, Diagana's hometown. But, you know, uh, I had to treat it like any other race. I had to stay focused and just run like I know I can. Uh, you've had two or three close races. I saw you in Glasgow in the, in the match against the Brits the other day, and you, you, you were always coming late. But, I mean, is that a deliberate judgment? I mean, you couldn't have took, made it any finer today. No, you know, uh, no, it's still early for me. Uh, this is only my seventh race of the season. Uh, I'm going to go back home after this train and get ready uh, for the World Championships. By then, you know, everything should be clicking. Coming up towards the bell now in this men's 800 metres, Robert Chichir leads them through, 50.29, that is very quick. Booker in second place, the Swiss athlete who's got the fastest time in the world this year, wearing 41, and Borzhakovsky, this brilliant young Russian, wearing 42 in the blue vest, right at the back of the field. There's about a 20 metre gap now between him and Booker. Booker is stretching away, just over 200 metres to go. There's about 10 metres now between him and the chasing pack. Borzhakovsky is still back in about 7th or 8th place. Booker did exactly the same tactics in Rome last week, and surely he's got this one wrapped up. This is superb running by Andre Booker. Borzhakovsky there, he's got to go extremely wide. There's no way he's going to catch Booker this time. Undu Imana of Burundi coming through, wearing number 45, and Borzhakovsky is closing, but Booker's win it. Borzhakovsky in second place. What a superb run by Booker, 143.35 there. Borzhakovsky's going to look back at this one and think, my goodness, I've got to get these tactics better. The fastest time in the world this year for Andrei Booker, and a new Russian record for Borzhakovsky. Andre, another very, very impressive performance. You, you look as though you're just about in the shape of your life at the moment. Um, actually, I'm running as good as I probably never did before, especially. I just start in front and keep going and going and can keep a high rhythm nearly to the last 50 meters, which is good. And also good is that I got better from race to race now. I take some time off now so that I'm not um, getting worse. <laughs> towards the World Championship, so that was a good um, test for me, the six race within 12 days, and I'm now going back to training and then preparing for the World Championships. The women's high jump was won by Bulgaria's Vanelina Veneva, beating a class field including World Indoor Champion Kaiser Bergfist. Two metres the height, and she made it look easy. Kostas Gatsiudis won his second Golden League in a row with a throw of 86 metres 81. 
Not as far as in Rome, but enough to confirm that he will be a major threat to Zelesny and the rest in Edmonton. The 100 meter hurdles came down to Ennis London of Jamaica versus Jenny Adams of the United States. Ennis London in lane four led from the gun but was going so quickly she struck the last hurdle with her lead leg and went down. Jenny Adams was left in first place. Clearly Ennis London should have won but things don't always go to plan. A second win then of the week to Jenny Adams of the United States. Just over 300 meters to go in the men's 1500. The world record holder El Garouge is away. He's being chased by two very good Kenyans, William Chichir and Bernard Lagat, but El Garouge floating along the ground. William Chichir wearing 116, just going past his teammate. But the world record holder's got about 10 meters on them. It's so, so quick as well. Not a world record, but this could be the fastest time we've seen anywhere in the world this year. That's going back a little bit at the moment. Shabun in there, the Russian, in the blue, but they're about 25 meters back. El Garouge, making amends once again for that huge disappointment last year in the Olympic final when beaten by Noen Yen. He's going to win 3.28.39, the fastest time we have seen in the world this year. Lagat was third, his teammate Chichir in second place. El Garouge looking superb, and that was a superb run in this Golden League. Well, Marion Jones drawing the fourth lane in this 100 metres. Not a totally convincing performance in Lausanne midweek. She's in the next lane to Chandra Stirrup of the Bahamas. Uh, she's in lane five. Then Pintasevic Block of the Ukraine. She's running so well this season in lane three. Christy Gaines, the American champion, is in lane two. Should be between those uh, four, but uh, Jones, well, hey. fit is she? Well, Stirrup gets away well and Stirrup has had a brilliant start and she's leading at the moment of Jones in second place and uh, Pintasevic block coming through but here comes Marion Jones and she's back to her old best form look at that Marion Jones from Pintasevic block from Chandra Stirrup and the time is very very fast indeed 10 Point eight four. Oh, I say, conditions absolutely perfect, and Chandra Stewart must have frightened her here. She was way ahead, and then the tall, powerful American sprinter came through. What a good run that was. A brilliant finish. She's back to her whole self. Well, that was more like the Marion we know and love tonight. <laughs> I kind of got it together tonight. Um, Trevor and I talked, and we think I was lacking in a bit of rhythm the past couple of races, and... I tried to get focused, I had a bad start again, and I have to work on that, but that's pretty good. I can run 1084 with a horrible start like that, and that's not a bad race. I was going to say, the smile is back on your face, which we all like to see, but uh, you know, how, do you, how do you think things are going really? I've heard that you're thinking about going back home, maybe to, to, to rest before the championship. Um, yeah, we, we were considering going back home after Oslo and then coming back over for London. Um, and, and I think it's just the fact that... You know, this is a jam-packed series for me, these five meets, and um, we have nine days off between Oslo and London, and we thought it's a six-hour flight home. So I go home, wash some clothes, spend some time with my dogs, and come back and, and be able to put a good performance in before London, and then go over to Edmonton. Well, let's bring you up to date with that fine performance, 10.84. Pintasevich, 10.96, and Stirrup, 10.99. Good race, that. That's all from Paris and Athletics Focus for this week. The Golden League continues next Friday in Oslo, and we'll have highlights of that when we come live from Birmingham for the World Championship Trials next Saturday. Yes, and we'll certainly look forward to those trials in Birmingham next weekend. Certainly pressure on the British athletes there, uh, trying to gain a place to the World Championships. Of course, Tim Hemman today is trying to gain a place into the Wimbledon final, become the first player for 63 years. But he's going to have to have a long wait, I'm afraid. He was due on court here at 1 o'clock. We told you it was raining a short time ago, and I'm afraid that uh, situation has not changed here at Wimbledon. You see the covers still on. The tent is up on centre court. Spectators are milling around, but I'm afraid it's not looking too hopeful. Once again, we, we need a strong breeze here just to blow those clouds away, and we haven't got that at the moment. So I'm afraid it looks like these spectators here are in for a long wait on centre court. But the spectators out on court 14 are certainly being entertained because for the first time at these championships, we have a demonstration of wheelchair tennis. And it's just to show the public that it is the fastest uh, growing wheelchair sport in this country. And well done to Kevin Plowman, Dave Gardner, Matt Foucher and Shane Everett Sharp who are out on court playing through the rain. doesn't matter to them what the conditions are like and you can see that they have attracted a large crowd. Very talented players out on court 14 at the moment. 
But uh, earlier today, of course, uh, the players uh, due on centre court, they were out practising. Tim Hemman was here early, obviously, because he expected a one o'clock start out on court. Again, not really going through anything too strenuous, just a light warm-up before. Of course, he leads two sets to one and 2-1 in the fourth set against Goran Ivanisevic. And talking of Goran, he, as usual, I think he must be a little superstitious because every day he's been out at Orangi Park practicing. And as we heard from Martina Navratilova earlier in the championships, the courts are very different out there. So he must just like the feel of being out at Orangi, just keep the routine exactly the same because it's certainly worked for him in these championships. He's won five matches here at Wimbledon. Before that, he'd only won eight matches during the whole year. So it's certainly going well for uh, Goran. And in fact, this is live out on uh, court three, I believe, uh, Pat Rafter. So it just shows that uh, along with the, the wheelchair uh, players out on court 14, not the only ones, Pat Rafter is just again here for a, an hour or so. Of course, he has a day off. Uh, today, he'll be back for the final and no doubt will be keeping an eye on centre court later on to see uh, who he will meet in tomorrow's final. But that's certainly hopeful that Pat's out there playing. It shows that the rain is definitely easing. So, talking of tennis, joining me in the studio, familiar face, Jana Novotna, and uh, that is certainly a familiar name to a list of great champions who have lifted the trophy here, that famous Venus Rosewater dish at Wimbledon. I said familiar face, we didn't see much of you. Yes, I know. <laughs> just when I had that moment to hold the dish up. <laughs> but the, what, just explain what that is like, because uh, we mentioned at the top of the program how beautiful that trophy mm. is. I think it's the most spectacular one in tennis. It really is. It's really beautiful. And, uh, and maybe the unfortunate thing is that you really don't get to enjoy everything about winning Wimbledon, because everything is happening so fast. And, you know, after you win, you want to go and say hi to all your supporters and share that with everybody there. And just, you know, that's a very brief moment you're focusing you want to look nice on the pictures as well <laughs> of course it's important because that's going to stay with you for life and um, you know so I took the time after the championship actually after my doubles final uh, to really take a good look at it once again because I said you know I'm probably never going to hold it again so why not to look at it again do you still look back at it now and again to reminisce and yes, the tape? of course. <laughs> <laughs> I would if I had. Definitely I would. But uh, talking of the, of the final today, the ladies' final, I mean, they, they were expecting to be on at 2 mm. o'clock. I mean, that isn't going to, to be possible. So that's awkward for, for both players. But I think particularly Justine in her first final. I mean, you just explain what it was like for you on... on in your first final here? Well, I think it was a little bit in my first final, yeah. like going back to how many finals I've been <laughs> here. In, so, no, every final is, of course, different, and everybody handles the situation differently. But, of course, it's very unusual today not to be the first on court at 2 o'clock. I mean, that certainly helps because you can go through your normal routine and just get ready for the 2 o'clock start. But for them, it's going to be really, really hard. But I think that both players are quite experienced. They're just going to enjoy being in the finals. And, you know, whenever they're ready to go out and play, they will be certainly ready to to go. I wasn't taking you too far back to your first final. Though. Not that I, I know you particularly <laughs> like talking about it, 93, but it's not that not that long ago. You know, I really don't mind. I mean, I think that everybody made much bigger deal out of it than I mm. did. And um, the good thing about it was that, you know, for us tennis players, I guess it's much easier because um, you get to play every other week, and you know you can just forget about it very quickly, and you can just go on and on. And you know, I really have only good memories out of the mm. 93, 97, and then finally winning at 98. So Wimbledon is a very special place for me, and mm. I always love to come back. It's just people like me that keep bringing it up. But as you say, you won it in 98, <laughs> and, and that's really is what matters. But back to this final. I mean, Venus Williams, she she won it last year. Mm -hmm. She's come here and uh, with hardly any matches, and yet she's just raced through the tournament. 
Yes, but it's, it's not unusual for Venus. I mean, as, as far as I can remember, Venus doesn't really like to play that much before the Grand Slams. And for some reason, these girls, both of them, they have so much confidence that it doesn't really matter to them. They come out here and they are already saying, you know, I'm going to get to the finals or I'm going to win the whole championship. For some reason, they really can just regroup, get ready at home, and they just come out here and be really on top of the game, which, which really is amazing to me because most of us, most of other players, they like to get the preparation and they need to get the confident prior to the big championship but for them it doesn't really make any difference I mean as long as they can practice as long as they are healthy they can just come out here and just play their best tennis and I've got to say that the women's game ha has changed and continues to change it seems <laughs> yearly and they seem to be getting taller and stronger I mean we I mean I'm not sure we'd exist much anymore so I certainly mm -hmm. wouldn't I mean how, mm -hmm. how tall are you I'm five nine. Oh, so you were okay then I, yeah, was, I was just at the edge yeah but <laughs> Venus okay. six foot one but Justine mm -hmm. is, is, is so small she does so well for a player who's not that tall she really does and I think that's the one thing that you have to give it to her and it just shows you how talented this player is because she because she can put up with that power and she can compensate which is really unusual because mm -hmm. we haven't seen much of that I mean in the last two years or so because it's been so powerful so dominant but Justine Hannon just has managed to play very intelligent tennis mm -hmm. and because she has that beautiful back and drive but she can also slice it she can just keep her opponents honest most of the time okay well let's uh, talking of Justin Enan she certainly is the new story of tennis and we talked about her height well she'd actually be the shortest champion if she wins today since Billie Jean King won back here in 1975 Billie Jean was five foot four and a half and an important half I'm told but anyway let's find out more now about Justin Enan from Belgium She's fresh-faced, slender of frame, almost three stones lighter than Venus Williams, but Belgian elfin Justine Enna is living proof that good things come in small packages. Size doesn't matter. Uh, when she's six, seven years old, she's so small, and all players have one of two heads more than her. And the, the, the father and the mother say, OK, Justine, come on, uh, go through, uh, hit him, go ahead. And she, she learned that from the first time that she hit the tennis ball. She heard that, she learned that, and after that, uh, OK, she's, she's like that today. She don't scare even if it's Lindsay, like, uh, it's like a monster for her. I must say, I speak to a lot of athletes, but I don't manage to speak to many of them who are on the same eye level as me. <laughs> You're five feet five inches and three quarters of an inch. Yeah, three quarters. And is that important it. to you? Yeah, that's important. <laughs> no, for sure. I, I never, I never think about my size. I think that I'm like that. I play with my game, and I don't think about everything about the game. A natural talent, Justine's sporting potential was obvious from a very early age. Even before she picked up a racket, at the age of four, her ball skills were attracting attention from the local television network. But fortunately for tennis, her hand-eye coordination was even better. Justine entered one of Belgium's national tennis centres and began to stack up trophies and junior titles galore. With her for five years, her Spanish coach has applied the finishing touches. When I uh, was uh, with her for the first time, I saw her play and I say, this girl is for sure for me minimum in the top 20s. And after two years later, I say, OK, She's able to go to the top 10 and maybe one day win a Grand Slam. But her coach can't claim credit for that backhand. The prettiest shot in tennis, I think. Did anyone teach you that backhand? Anyone, no, it's natural. And when I was six, when I had my first lesson, I had, I had it, I said, okay, if I play tennis, it will be with a one hand back, and I think it's beautiful, it's easier, and for me, that was uh, natural. Hena, though, has had to learn to be self-reliant. With the death of her mother to cancer six years ago, Justine had to grow up very quickly, helping to bring up her two brothers and sister, along with her father, Jose. I think I'm mature, 
very very much for my age and I lived in a lot of things in my young life so I just want to play tennis keep focus on my game and try to enjoy the, the this this passion because you know it's fantastic to have this possibility to be a tennis player and I like to travel and that I think that's a fantastic life so I just try to enjoy it and be cool on the on the court it was this year at the French Open that Enam's junior potential nearly translated into senior success when she and compatriot Kim Kleisters fought out an historic all-Belgian Grand Slam semi-final. Enam lost, so too Kleisters in the final, but 10 million Belgians were ecstatic. King Albert gave them both a royal seal of approval. But in front of British royalty on centre court for the very first time, Justine initially looked less assured in Thursday's semi-final. Steely composure eventually turned the match around and double Grand Slam champion Jennifer Capriati was shown the exit door, even though Justine herself couldn't find it. As I heard that at the rain break, you didn't know how to get back to the dressing rooms, is that true? Yeah, that's true. I completely, I didn't find my way and I was focused on the match, so I didn't see it. <laughs> but you found it eventually, over Yeah, I found it and after this, when I came back, I, play, I played well, so I don't mind about that. <laughs> how much is it to Venus's advantage that she's been through this before she's walked in curtsied with the flowers all the paraphernalia that comes with the final because surely that's more daunting than the final itself isn't it yeah i don't know any, anything about a final especially in wimbledon so yeah for sure she has an, an advantage but you know when you are young and it's it's too cool to be here in, at 19 years old so i will i will go on the court just to play my game and we'll see what's going to happen i don't know what what will happen tomorrow but we will see I like to see you without your cap. We yeah. haven't seen you very often. It's nice to see the real Justine. Yeah, the real Justine, yeah. And how much does the real Justine want this title? Oh, she wants it too much and so much. So she will just go on the court to to enjoy the match to and if possible to win because I think that I have I have a chance. I will go on the court to win and I will do my best just to do this. She certainly looked like a champion in the early days and she's uh, been on court here this morning at Wimbledon, Justin Annan. Again, just uh, going through the final preparations for the biggest match of her life. Well, she will have many supporters, of course, uh, on centre court, including in the Royal Box, because uh, Jester arriving here at Wimbledon, His Royal Highness Prince Philippe and Her Royal Highness Princess Mathilde of Belgium, they have arrived uh, guests in the Royal Box today. And, uh, have so much uh, success in Belgian tennis now, of course, Kim Kleisters, runner-up uh, at Roland Garros at the French Open just last month, and now Justin Ennan into the final of Wimbledon, uh, being greeted there by the chairman, Tim Phillips. And they will be making their way through, but uh, they might have to have a rather long lunch and a long wait, I'm afraid, because uh, it doesn't look likely that uh, the women's final will be on time at two o'clock because this is the scene on centre court at the moment. Uh, definitely the umbrellas, a lot of the umbrellas have gone down. Oh, well, not in that shot, maybe, but they certainly have outside my window here. Maybe it's that wheelchair tennis again I'm watching out here. But uh, still light rain falling, and, uh, and that is the situation on centre court. So uh, we were hoping to bring you tennis at uh, one o'clock, but of course, as build on grandstand, uh, we will be able to bring you now coverage of round six of the British Superbike uh, Championship. That'll be in about 10 minutes or so continue to keep you an update uh, on the weather but uh, Jana just looking